I'm Taylor. And I'm Tyler. And I'm Fred. This is Book of Mormon Central's Come Follow Me Insights. Today, the books of Amos and Obadiah. And this is a treat. We get to invite our friend and colleague, Fred Woods, to join us today. Uh, Fred did his, his PhD work in the Hebrew Bible. Even though he teaches in church history and doctrine, his, I think his heart lies in this Old Testament, right? Certainly in part. A man of many talents. That's wonderful. <laughs> so thank you for joining us. So initially, Fred, what would you say to people as they, as they launch into a study of Amos and Obadiah from, from perhaps a, a 30,000 foot overview of these, these two books that are often overlooked in the Old Testament? What would people need to know to be able to initially dive in and make some sense of what we're talking about here? Well, the first thing that comes to me, Tyler, is a passage in 2 Peter where Peter, the chief apostle, says, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old times by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So I think first and foremost with any book, it's getting the same spirit that rested on the prophets, understanding that's the only way we're really going to get it, paying the price in prayer, asking for the Lord to help us to understand in plainness the things that are being taught. That's a really powerful reminder that while scriptures are written by the gift and the power and the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that's how they're going to be interpreted too if, if we want to have any meaning or any value out of it. Yeah, just a reminder that when we read the scriptures, we should look for Jesus and we should look for principles of the gospel. That can give us a framework and a lens so that we can understand words that were written a very long time ago in a different culture that sometimes might feel a little confusing. But if you seek for the gospel, you will find it in the scriptures. Okay, let's, let's jump in with Amos. He is not your typical prophet. Usually you get a prophet who, who comes from a certain background and they've been trained and ready to go to one degree or another. And Amos makes it very clear right out of the, the gate here that he's, he's a little different. So in verse 1 it says, The words of Amos, who was among the herdmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. So this gives us kind of a setting of when and where and who this guy is. Yeah, so Amos, as we see here, it's interesting this herdsman, it's actually no kid. It's a sheep breeder, so he's breeding sheep. Reminds me of uh, President Ezra Tapp Benson from Whitney, Idaho. This is a farm boy that's been called to a cosmopolitan northern kingdom, and uh, maybe he doesn't have, uh, you know, all the stuff that you'd find um, from someone from LA and New York but he certainly has the availability of a Joseph Smith. And quite frankly, his book is, what amazes me, he's so articulate, and yet he's coming from that background. And again, I think of Joseph Smith that was unlearned, but when the Spirit got a hold of him, I mean, you just think, for example, of the allegory of, of Jacob, mm -hmm. um, or Zenus, I should say, in Jacob 5, and you just see the Lord taking over and this book is just, it's, it's just powerful. So in verse 1, we got the timing of these two kings, one down in Judah, one up in, in Israel, and then he says two years before the earthquake, which gives us kind of a timestamp. Yes, it does. So we're talking mid-8th century BC, just a little bit before Isaiah to give us an idea of, uh, you know, being contemporaries, but I, I think this is a superscription, so uh, we need to keep in mind uh, Tekoa. This is about 12 miles from Jerusalem, six miles from Bethlehem. And when I think of no kid as a sheep breeder, I've often thought of the New Testament. In Luke chapter 2, it talks about how we have these sh shepherds watching over the sheep by night, <clears throat> this flock. And uh, the word in Syriac in the Peshitta is naki. So this isn't any, uh, you know, any normal flock, but these were pure, the word naki, pure, fit, proper flock, destined for the temple. And I've often wondered if um, 
we have Amos that had something to do with that. We don't know for sure, but he but he's a shepherd, and we know from chapter seven, verse fourteen, he was also he's a herdman, but he's also a gatherer of sycamore fruit. So, um, <clears throat> but the key, I think, the key in all of this in verse one is that it's two years before the earthquake. This really sets us up, and I can't emphasize this enough, and really I have to give credit to my uh, emeritus colleague, Kelly Ogden, who did his dissertation at University of Utah on the geography of Amos, uh, that this, uh, he would say, Kelly would tell you that this really sets us up for um, the idea that we're going to see a lot of earthquake motifs going running through the book, that earthquake motif, as we'll see and we'll stop at times, but the still small voice gets louder when Israel doesn't listen. Now, that's a beautiful lesson for the 8th century BC that I think is just as applicable, if not more so, in the 21st century AD. Yes, and in fact, as we get into this, I would like to just, uh, you know, the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion, but the Doctrine and Covenants, President Benson said, is the capstone, and as we get into this today, we want to make sure we're following that pattern of likening the Scriptures unto ourselves. I love this in Doctrine and Covenants, section 43, verse 25, uh, coming off what Tyler just said. The Lord says, O ye nations of the earth, how often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathereth her chickens under wings, but you would not. How often have I called upon you by the mouth of my servants, by my angels, by my own voice, by the voice of thunderings, lightnings, tempests, earthquakes, hailstones, famines, and pestilence of every kind, and would have saved you with an everlasting salvation, but you would not. And, and we see the same thing in the Doctrine and Covenants in section 88, verse 89. And after your testimony comes the testimony of earthquakes that shall cause groanings in the midst of her. And also cometh the testimony of the voice of thunderings, lightnings, voice of tempests, the voice of waves of the sea heaving themselves beyond their bounds. And I see this as we approach the second coming of the Lord. It seems like the voice is just simply getting louder because we're not listening. Because ye would not. <laughs> you would not. You won't follow me. You won't trust me. Uh, and, and look at what happens now back in chapter 1 of Amos, verse 2, and he said, the Lord will roar from Zion. <laughs> that whisper. Doesn't sound like a still small yeah. voice at that point in their history, and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the habitations of the shepherds shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. If you, if you look at a map of the, the Holy Land, you have the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, the Dead Sea down here. Here's Jerusalem. Mount Zion is on the, the west side of Jerusalem, and Mount Moriah, where the temple's built, is on the east side. There's Jerusalem, your capital city. Mount Carmel is clear up here in the north. It's, it's 80 miles away, and he's saying the, the Lord is not going to be whispering at this point. The message is going to be spread, and it's not going to be a message of of peace and and reward being granted. Absolutely. I just want to say something about this. I'm, I don't think that uh, – when we think of Mount Carmel, I'm thinking of fructification, fertility. I mean, uh, 250 due nights a year. I mean, this is really the Prophet Joseph Smith in the Doctrine and Covenants again relating revelation to the idea of the dews of heaven, the doctrine of the priesthood shall distill on thy soul as a soul as the dews from heaven. And I want to just take something from that because I think this is really interesting that the top of Carmel shall wither because Israel, before they enter the promised land, this is back in Deuteronomy chapter 10. This is very uh, powerful. In fact, let's just, uh, let's go right into 11 verse 10. The land that you go into is not like Egypt, right? They're going to have to rely on the rain of heaven. Uh, this this uh, water metaphor, so powerful, the word for teacher in Hebrew, right, is, um, is first rain, the same word. It's the first rain of the spring. 
The word to cause you to drink, right, in Hebrew is to teach you, uh, to prophesy, to drip water from your mouth. It's a powerful, I mean, where did the word brainstorm come from? And we're, when we see in Deuteronomy, the Lord says, look, when you come into the land, Deuteronomy eleven fourteen, I will give the rain of your land in due season, but then he says, beware of yourselves that you be not deceived. If you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them, then the Lord's wrath shall be shut up and there will be no rain. And so as I'm looking here at Amos, it hits me really quick. The Lord is, the Lord will roar from Zion, as you said. You see the synonymous parallelism as well. He'll roar from Zion. He'll utter his voice from Jerusalem. Zion and Jerusalem to a Jew are one thing. And you see the idea that even Mount Carmel, that usually has these, this wonderful um, ability to produce dew, it's just going to wither. So th- I think this is important as we get into it to see the consequence. Absolutely. So now he, he launches in for the rest of chapter 1 and most of chapter 2, he's going to take us on a, on a field trip in, in this whole region, and he's going to show us how each of these peoples have rejected him as their god and they've turned to these other gods and they're trusting in the arm of flesh and in these these idols to deliver them. So he begins in verse 3 with Damascus. So you get this group up north in Syria who are struggling, and so he promises that he's going to send send fire. Back to the verse that that you used earlier, Fred, from the Doctrine and Covenants, you won't listen to my prophets, so I'm going to get your attention in a different way. Uh, And then from Damascus, now in verse 6, we come down to Gaza, down here on the the, uh, coast of the Mediterranean Sea in the south, and then we go back up to the coast of the Mediterranean Sea on the north to Tyre or Tyrus as it's listed in verse 9. And then we come down here to Edom, south and east of the the lands of the Israelites, and then he comes north to Ammon, and then he goes into chapter 2 with Moab, which is straight east of the Jordan River, and then – did you notice this? Did you notice that Amos has basically said whether you look north, south, east, or west, any of these directions, you've got people who have rejected the words of the prophets, and each one of them are given promises of what's going to come to them, and none of those promises are good. They're all punishment. They're all destruction. And now, with that in place, and keep in mind, it's mid-8th century, so we're 760 BC, we're about 40 years from Assyria coming in and wiping out all of these nations and carrying the tribes of Israel captive. Now that we've set up the surrounding area, now notice he launches in in verse 4 with the kingdom of Judah, and then in verse 6 with the kingdom of Israel, this northern ten tribes, and he gives them these dire prophecies as well. What I like about what's happening here is he uses this poetic format of for three and then for four. If you add those up, that's seven. So there's a symbolism of like complete punishment. You guys are completely off the rails. I'm going to completely bring the consequences. And so if you count, how many places did he identify as a problem? Now he's speaking to northern Israel, and so northern Israel is listening to this, and they're hearing, oh my gosh, there's seven places will get destroyed. And then God disrupts their expectations and adds an eighth, Israel itself. He breaks the pattern of seven, and the eighth one, that's three plus four, is Israel right here in verse six. And so it would have really shocked the hearers like, wait, we thought that the the punishments would just conclude with seven. We all heard the message, three plus four, seven times. You should be ending there with Judah. But no, God reserves the last for the one that most needs to hear it, and it's Israel. I think that's a great uh, point, uh, Taylor, and I was just thinking, I hadn't thought of this before, but that number eight, you know, is symbolic of accountability, mm-hmm. that it's, and you can probably imagine this reading that, yeah, yeah, get him here, you know, and then all of a sudden, it's like, uh, reminds me of David being upset 
about this parable that was spoken by Nathan, mm -hmm. and then you hear this Ish, thou art the man, Whew, wake up call, right? I want to just take what you both have said and lead us into, I think, what some important keys to understand, Amos, in addition to what you said. Can we flip over to 2 Nephi chapter uh, 25, if we could, and uh, look at a few things here? I think one of the keys to understanding the book of Amos is to use the Book of Mormon as well as the Doctrine and Covenants we already have as a guide. But I, it's interesting because you have Isaiah and Amos in that same 8th century BC, so after a dozen chapters that Nephi's uh, using here in the Book of Mormon, now we see this commentary, but I think it could be what's being said about Isaiah could be also said as this additional witness in Amos. You see in verse 1, where Nephi is talking about they know not concerning the manner of prophesying among the Jews, right? These prophetic uh, speech forms. And if you go to verse 3, it talks about knowing the judgments of God, which we see commencing in, in uh, these first chapters. Uh, it, it's, it's, so it's, it's complicated. In verse 4, he says, but those that are filled with the spirit of prophecy are going to get it. That's the first point we made. But I think this is also additionally really important in verse 6, and uh, Tyler mentioned this, the idea of the way that we understand Isaiah or Amos is to, and I quote, to know concerning the regions round about and concerning the judgments of God. So once, in fact, W.F. Albright once said that uh, the only way to understand Amos is to understand the geographical a background, and we, we also mentioned this earthquake motif. It's interesting, they're still talking about this earthquake in the book of Zechariah 250 years later, and we also have evidence of it uh, that's, uh, you know, archaeologists have unearthed in several places, but this is definitely, this, this voice is getting louder, and, and again, uh, pulling from the Book of Mormon. Um, uh, you, you, you recall in Helaman chapter 12 where the Lord says, and thus we see that except the Lord does chasten his people with many afflictions, with death, famine, and pestilence, they will not remember him. That's sobering. <clears throat> I, I would hope that those of you watching can analyze your own life and say, wait, am I willing to, to turn my heart and my life over to the Lord when the wind isn't blowing and the, the earth isn't shaking, when I have lots of other options available to me, am I willing to trust him to the point where I give my life to him now while there's a clear choice? Because there will be a day when, how did Elder Maxwell put it, it will be impossible to stand so it doesn't mean as much when you kneel at the coming of the Lord because it's impossible to stand at that point. Precisely. Uh, as I've been listening to you, I've been asking myself the question, what does it take for the Lord to move me to where he wants me to be? I'm even with, you know, the Smith family, Joseph's family, it's interesting what takes place with uh, uh, a, a terrible volcanic eruption that will move them a little farther west to a certain position. So, you know, and one thing I want to emphasize with all of this, the Lord loves us. He, you know, um, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and so he, he keeps, he's still after Israel. We'll see, in fact, in all of these prophetic books, I see this theme that reminds me of a bishop uh, talking to uh, young adults or um, the youth, the mutual, where maybe he's talking about the law of chastity and really laying it on the line uh, of uh, justice, but at the end, you know, uh, there is a way back. It's, you know, mercy. Uh, we see in these chapters where you have this, this uh, maybe we could call it uh, doom followed by hope, or the scattering followed by the gathering. But I want to emphasize, I think the Lord is always feeling after us, and the Mosaic Law was strict because the children of Israel needed it. But he is a loving God. Love that. Now watch as Amos, after he's, he's walked us through all these people surrounding the kingdom of Israel, keeping in mind that's his primary target up here, so north, south, east, west, all this destruction, and then it's going to come into your heart. Notice then how he, he speaks for the Lord as a prophet here. Look in verse 9, "'Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them whose height was like the height of cedars, 
going down to verse 10, also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you forty years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. I raised up your sons for prophets and of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord? He's, he's asking them, did I not do all of this? Have I not delivered you with a powerful, mighty arm, with this mercy? And then his response, but you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophet, saying, Prophesy not. Behold, I am pressed under you as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. Now there is a whole bunch of Hebrew poetic symbolism packed into that imagery. Yeah. It's interesting, too. All this has uh, happened after this cataloging of sins of uh, causing slavery, not taking care of the poor, but I want to just comment quickly on verse 13, I am pressed on you as a card. It's interesting that the name Amos Amos in Hebrew means burden, and I just pause for him. I mean, President Nelson is always smiling, but uh, I'm sure he's feeling the weight of his calling, and that's why we're encouraged in the Doctrine and Covenants to pray for the First Presidency. I mean, what a, what a weighty responsibility, especially for a farm boy to be sent to the cosmopolitan northern kingdom, you know, to go into the court and to lay this on the line, you just have to have so much respect for the courage uh, that this would take. But I, I also want to just comment quickly, if I could, Tyler, on it's interesting to me in verse 10, I'm, we're in Amos 2.10, the idea of possessing the lamb of the Amorites. So, of, of course, this is part of the Canaanites, and I, as soon as you said that, I was thinking of the great sermon in the Book of Mormon in 1 Nephi chapter 17, where you have the Lord talking about, again, how he brought them across the Jordan into the land of promise, and he makes the comment that the Lord esteemeth all flesh in one, right? The Israelites and the Amorite, right? And, but he that's favor, it was righteous is favor of God. Behold, this people, Amorite, Canaanite, had rejected every word of God. They were ripe in iniquity, and the, uh, the fullness of the wrath of God was upon them. I think this is, a, is an important point to touch on, and what I skipped over 2 Nephi 25 that I shouldn't have is in the ninth verse, where we have the Lord saying that among the Jews, Judah, right, and I, would, I believe this is true of every nation, for example, Jonah uh, going to the Assyrians, uh, it says, as one generation has been destroyed among the Jews because of iniquity, even so have they been destroyed from generation to generation according to their iniquities, and never hath any of them been destroyed, save it were foretold them by the prophets of the Lord. There's always the warning. There's always, uh, you know, this, the Lord always warns us before the, uh, the punishment. Well, this leads us right to chapter 3, where this lawsuit is presented by God through Amos, basically God's bringing the people to court. Like, listen, I have been faithful to you, and here's all the ways that you guys have not been faithful to me. And he concludes with this very powerful verse where it says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So right there in Amos 3, 7, meaning, I, the Lord God, do not do anything without first letting my messengers know. So we live in a time where there are many prophets and they're calling us unto God. And we shouldn't be surprised when things don't turn out in our lives the way that we think they should when we have failed to obey God. And I love kind of the underlying message here that the prophets, if we look at the underlying Hebrew, are actually invited into God's divine counsel to hear the message. And they go out almost as angelic messengers to tell us what they heard in God's divine counsel. So I feel this deep mercy. God's like, I'm not just having a little counsel all by myself and I hoard all the secrets. I tell them to people that you can trust. That's wonderful insight. I noticed when you were talking, I, I love that JST little note, Amos 3, 7, footnote A. Again, Joseph reading so carefully until, surely the Lord God will do nothing but or until he revealeth. Now, I've got to mention this, this a pun or a paranomasia in Hebrew. This is what I believe is like the manner of prophesying of the Jews. You don't get it in English, but in Hebrew, it is deliberate. You have in Hebrew, surely the Lord God will do nothing but he galah, which means revealing, 
uh, his secret unto his servants, the prophets, but they, it's, it's interesting, gula in Hebrew means removing, so he will always reveal before he removes, meaning exile. And I think this is deliberate in the text, and we, we see it in various places here among the, the minor prophets where the people in their language are going to get this. Uh, you're going to get the gala before the gula, or you're going to be warned, right? It's going to be revealed to you before the removal, before the exile. But how many times were they warned before they were removed? That's profound. Profound, and especially in the context, as, as Taylor was talking earlier about the, this court case where the evidence is being presented, if you look at the verses leading up to that famous verse 7, you can see the Lord, kind of to use Isaiah's phrase, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. There are times when God, it's as if he's sitting across from us saying, can we just, can we just lay out some things and reason together for a minute? And so he asks all of these rhetorical questions from verse 3 down through verse 6, things like, can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion ruin the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion crowd of his den if he have taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is for him? And he keeps asking these questions, and then in that context of all of these, well, the answer's obvious, the answer's obvious to that one, and the answer's obvious to that one, and then at the end of all of these very uh, obvious questions comes this, this verse that we've been talking about, surely the Lord God will do nothing. It, it, and just as obvious of all these other things are, I am not doing my work in secret. It's, it's given to you by these prophets, but you're not listening to the prophets, so now you're going to have to listen to these other voices that aren't very pleasant. They're filled with destruction. Yeah, and speaking of destruction, it's interesting to me as we, as we move through the text and you, you get this uh, captive imagery like in verse 12 of the a roaring lion, right? That children, uh, that children of Israel will be removed, no doubt. Talking about and about three decades later, where the Assyrians uh, take Israel and uh, the ten tribes captive. But but I love this. I want to go back to this earthquake motif. Look at verse fourteen. That in that day, right, the day that they're going to be taken, I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, and I will visit the altars of Bethel. Now, remember, this is the time of Jeroboam II, mid-18th century, but Jeroboam I, right, remember, he's the one that sets up these false places of worship in Dan and Bethel because he figures out, and from a political standpoint of, uh, uh, that we want to make, that if the birdies fly south to Jerusalem, he's going to lose that power. So he changes, you know, his, he gets his own priesthood set up, he's changing the calendar dates. Hey, you don't need to go that far, we can have him right in our kingdom. So Bethel, which means house of God, is really prostituted in the sense that it becomes a place of false worship. So what's the Lord going to do? The way I'm reading this, and I may not have it right, is the horns of the altar shall be cut off. Remember, horns are symbolic of power. And there were the horns on the altar where you would grab onto, right, and uh, wanting uh, mercy. But I believe it's the earthquake that breaks off those horns. They're cut off, right? No mercy, right? You, you ripen in iniquity. We heard this three and four that Taylor talked about. And notice again the shaking. I will smite the winter house in the summer house and the house of ivory, right? Come down out of your ivory towers shall perish and the great houses shall have an end saith the Lord. Definitely sounds like earthquake imagery that nothing will stand with yeah, that much shaking. Nothing. And that's why I think you also get the teetering in chapter 2, verse 13. I am pressed unto you like a cart. Well, yeah, he's feeling responsibility, but I think you see this chapter after chapter where this, uh, we see this, the voice is getting louder, the roaring out of Jerusalem. And so the only way to be not knocked over is to be grounded in God. That's a great insight. So if you're grounded in God, you won't be shaken loose. So you can feel, you can sense this uh, crescendo, if you will, uh, through the book of Amos. So he's he's walked them through the, the descriptions of the geography in 1 and 2 and the, the burden of a prophet, and then in verse 3, this idea that, that God has prepared all of this way, but they're still rejecting the prophets, 
So what do we do? Now we open up uh, chapter 4 with, instead of you hearkening to the prophets, you are speaking louder to the people, things like verse 4, come to Bethel and transgress, at Gilgal, multiply transgression, bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years. These are those, those idolatry centers in the northern kingdom, and they're, they're calling for people to come and offer these sacrifices to these idols in opposition to the voice of the prophets. So what happens? Uh, verse 6, I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and want of bread in all your places, yet have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Even when you're in a famine, you're still going to these false temples and not worshiping me. Now, this, this is going back to uh, Helaman 12, right? Death, famine, pestilence, you still won't remember me. I think it's also such a great thing as I honestly, I think about Utah County, there's a lot of great things about Utah County, but I, when I read 2 Nephi 28, I'm thinking, you know, that uh, just this this whole idea, I'm, I'm not going to, I remember President Lisi, don't paraphrase Harold B. Lee, I'm going to give it to you straight from the text. I want you to think about this as we go into chapter 4, verse 1, this idea that others will he pacify and lull them into carnal security, that they will say, all is well in Zion, Zion pro prospereth, all is well, and thus the devil cheateth their souls and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. So this is not in the spirit of, of preaching, but just in trying to teach. We all need this. I know I need reminders daily. And, uh, but I, I see this in chapter 4, verse 1, and by the way, we should always read the headings of these chapters, okay? These were written by Elder Bruce R. McConkie, who was a scriptorian, scriptorian, and it often will give us not only an overview, but really a, a nice a doctrinal um, peek at something. But let me just begin with chapter 4, verse 1. Hear this word, ye kind of Bashan. So these are the wealthy women of Israel, they're being likened unto cows, okay? This is like where the Golan Heights, what are they doing? They're oppressing the poor. They don't care about the poor. They're, you know, they're drinking. If you look at this carefully, it's very interesting what's going on, where they're just not caring about anybody but themselves. And if you've ever been to the British Museum in London, I mean, there's reliefs, a certain reliefs where you have people being taken out. Look at verse 2. What's going to happen? Because of your pride, you're going to be abased. And in fact, when you're taken out of the land by the Assyrians, they're going to put a hook through your nose and just line you up like a fishing line. So again, the Lord plays, uh, pr you know, he pleads with them to, uh, to come away from this, to return to me in verse 8. And we have, uh, you know, he's re withholding the rain. Why is he doing it? He's trying to get them to return. It's interesting, this word return means shuv. It means to literally to turn. You know, the backsliding Israel, they need to turn, that we see like in Jeremiah, to return to the Lord. So now watch as the tone shifts a little bit as we jump into chapter 5 where, where you, you see this pleading, this strong urging and exhortation coming from the prophet Amos. And Watch, I, I love this chapter because right there in the chapter heading, it's, it talks about Israel exhorted to seek the Lord. Look for that word seek in chapter 5. It's everywhere. This is the chapter of what are you actually looking for? Stop looking for the things of the world and seek the Lord. So you see it in verse 4, for thus saith the Lord unto the house of Israel, seek ye me, to what end? and ye shall live. The implication is, if you choose not to seek me, Assyria is coming, yes. and some of you won't live, and those of you who do live will wish that you weren't alive, because they're going to make your life miserable. So if you think that keeping God's commandments is bad <laughs> or hard, you wait till you bring upon you the oppression and the bondage of the world and the bondage of sin and yeah, and think, servitude. Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great thematic word here, and, and it's interesting, three times on one page, maybe more, but you get it in verse 4, you get it in seek, uh, 6, again, seek the Lord, you shall live. Uh, verse 8, I see it again, seeking, uh, maybe we see it down in, I'm thinking 14, seek good and not evil that you may live, and so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as you have spoken. I, I just again emphasize the long-suffering 
of our Heavenly Father and really uh, seeking after us. Uh, how long is it going to take for us to turn to him? Uh, what does it take to move us to where he wants us to get to? And then he concludes us with some interesting thoughts. He tells people, you shouldn't be seeking after the day of the Lord. Now, many of us in the modern restoration think about the day of the Lord as this glorious time where Jesus comes and sets everything right. Well, Amos is kind of, Amos is highlighting the negative aspects that when the day of the Lord comes, it means he has shown up to execute judgment. So you don't really want the day of the Lord to come until you have taken the time to fully and truly seek him and repent. Then it's a glorious day. Sometimes in scripture we hear the great and dreadful day of the Lord. It's great for people who've repented and who've sought the Lord, and it's dreadful for those who have not, kind of like the audience that Amos was talking to so many centuries in the past. Which, by the way, many of these people are probably patting each other and themselves on the back saying, I, I don't know what this crazy guy's talking to us about because we're good, we're going to the temple, we're performing sacrifices, we're, we're making offerings at that altar as well as these other altars, we won't talk about that, but, but we're worshiping the Lord and we're keeping the Sabbaths and these the, the festivals and the new moons, and I love what the Lord says to them through Amos starting in verse 21, and these are very strong words. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. Why? No, it's, it's not authorized. It's not in the right place, right? It was only to be the temple. They're just kind of gone out on a limb. Their hearts aren't right. It reminds me of something, uh, Tyler, uh, from, uh, from Jacob that's quoted in 2 Nephi chapter 2. If we could just quickly move to verse uh, 2 Nephi 2.6, this powerful sermon uh, by Jacob, brother Nephi, he says, redemption comes in and through the holy Messiah, for he is full of grace and truth. He offereth himself a sacrifice for sin to answer the ends of the law unto all those who have a broken heart and a contrite spirit, and unto none else can the ends of the law be answered. Israel has a problem with pride at this time, like modern Israel does as well at times, but it's so interesting to me that it, it has to be done the proper way. Broken heart, contrite spirit, being authorized the proper way, the proper priesthood. There's some great lessons here. I love that. I was thinking about your note about how people like pat themselves on the back. I remember many years ago when I was younger, my dad had attended a general conference and President, President Benson had done his powerful famous talk about pride. And my dad reported to me afterwards, he was out in the hallway hearing all these people saying, that was such a fabulous talk. I really wish sister so-and-so was here to have heard that or brother so-and-so. And it still stuck with me as a teenager all these years later that often we miss that the messages are for us, and it's not enough for us to simply rest on our laurels or look at the good we've done in the past. We should consistently be seeking after God, and when we hear a message from the prophets, say, Lord, is it I? Such a powerful reminder, all of these concepts, as you now come back into Amos 5 with this concept of, of the Lord totally rejecting all of these things that these people are doing in their own mind in, in a religious or sacred context, but it's not helping them at all. The real question isn't for us to go back and analyze this 8th century group of people and what they did wrong. The power of scripture study is when we can pull this off the page and say, hmm, I wonder what those sacrifices are for me, those, those solemn feasts, those, the, the incense burning, I wonder what those are for me. Things that I'm going through the motions, patting myself on the back saying, ah, what, a, what a good guy I am. See, see how holy and righteous I'm being because of what I'm doing, and yet maybe what I'm doing isn't drawing me closer to God because at the end of the day, 
is it my going to church that saves me, or taking the sacrament, or going to the temple, or doing missionary work, or serving in the church, do those things save me, or do those things help connect me to my Savior? That's good. Do those things me. do those things bring me closer to Christ and help me learn about more fully what kind of a being he is that I'm trying to become like, and those are all opportunities to shape me, to mold me, to, to allow him to hone me to be able to use me as an instrument in his hands to do his work according to his will so that I'm no longer just going through the motions of going to church and reading my scriptures and praying and going to the temple. I'm coming unto Christ by doing all of those things. I'm serving people because I love God and I love them and I want them to be able to love God more fully. It's a, these, these reminders are so applicable today, just as much today as they were in the 8th century BC. I, I have a personal story that will builds on that. So I was taught well by my parents about diligently serving in the church, and so when I received the priest and had the opportunity to do home teaching, I was pretty diligent about it. I learned from my dad how important it was to be diligent. And throughout the years, I tried really hard to make sure that I was a 100% home teacher. I don't think I've ever told anybody, but for me, that was like partly how I identified myself as a member of the church, that I do 100% home teaching. Well, guess who had a bit of an identity crisis when the prophet said, listen, we need to minister and serve, and it's not simply about ticking off a box. And so there was an invitation for me to say, am I doing good with the right purpose? And I think for the most part I was, or am I just hoping to like check off these boxes so that I can feel better about myself versus purposely seeking out those who need a helping hand. What we say in the scriptures is to lift up, strengthen the feeble knees and lift up the hands that hang down. And so it was actually a bit of a wake-up call for me that I would gotten into a habit of doing home teaching and had started to miss the purpose for why that action would have mattered in the first place. Yeah, I think you both have made some great uh great points. I want to be a third witness to this, uh, to the tune of there's nothing old about the Old Testament. And so, you know, it, as religion teachers, as uh, as early morning seminary teachers, gospel doctrine teachers, I think one thing, even if we uh, understand, uh, like Tyler does so well, the geography of Israel, or we understand the poetic devices, uh, you know, we teach what we are, we've got to be living it ourselves but I think it's it's so important for a teacher at the end of the lesson to say, so what? So what What of all of this? And I was thinking, you know, again, going back to the Book of Mormon, where Nephi is quoting from Isaiah, but he would have had in the bra brass plates also Amos and others. He says that um, that I more, more fully persuade them to believe in the Lord, the Redeemer. I did read to them that which was written by the prophet Isaiah, again, in that contemporary 8th century B.C., for I did liken all Scripture unto us that it might be for our profit and learning. We've got to get that, and you two have done such a great job of, of uh, I think, just reminding us that, that we can't miss that. Uh, we just can't. And I think of some of these Israelites that, uh, you know, moved on to the spirit world. Uh, I often wonder, as I'm reading this, if they might be trying to whisper to us, what we find in Mormon 931, condemn me not because of my imperfections, but rather give thanks that God's made them manifest, mm -hmm. that you can learn to be more wise, right? That's Get right. it now. You're part of the family. Follow the covenant. Repent. Turn to him. The, the concept here, we're all teachers, and there's different ways for people to learn. You can learn through direct experience, and that's what's represented here, but what these scriptures were preserved so that we can experience vicariously and learn without having to have the direct experience of being destroyed or cast off, that we can learn from other people's direct experience to avoid some of these very negative outcomes. It's one of the powerful advantages of having these ancient witnesses. We get to learn indirectly from other people's direct experience. So now we turn to chapter 7, and, and Amos gives us a little bit of insight into his prophetic call, and he's going to use some analogies here up front in chapter 7 that any shepherd 
or somebody who works out with flocks in the fields would know very well, which to me is a symbol, yet again a reminder, that God speaketh unto men and women, to all of us, according to our language and our understanding. And so Amos is, God is speaking his language, using analogies he understands perfectly with, with grasshoppers coming and eating the beginning of the shoot of these grasses growing up, and then he uses that to teach principles of what the children of Israel are doing. Okay, so uh, just uh, going off what Tyler just said, I think it's important to go back to, um, to verse 14 where we see again that, that Amos, you know, Amaziah, who's the high priest in the court of Jeroboam, who's thinking, hey, go back to the southern kingdom. Don't miss it with me, you know. You go back and make your money as a paid prophet. And, and, and uh, you know, Amos says, I was no prophet, neither I was a prophet's son. In other words, he hasn't been trained as a prophet. This is not paid ministry. He's saying, look, and I was a I was a uh, Idaho farm boy, right? I'm from the southern kingdom. I was a herd man. I was a gatherer of, of sycamore fruit. So truly, you know, here's someone that was, he wasn't looking for the job. I, I think of, of Elder Maxwell who once made that great statement that God cares more about our availability than our ability. And if we prove our dependability, he will increase our capability. But um, but the Lord took someone, I think, you know, I think of Heber C. Kimball going on a mission, scared to death to go to England, right? He and Brigham Young had 11 days of learning, right? But they went, and because they were available, the Lord made weak things strong. And that's what he's doing with Amos. So now it culminates in chapter 8 with this ultimate prophecy of, you know what, Israel? E- you are actually not going to just experience earthquake and pestilence and disease and famine, you're actually going to be destroyed and, and carried away captive. And he, he makes some pretty serious uh, prophecies here, and then it culminates with what is the result. Verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. The implication there is that there won't be prophets to preach anything to the people, to reveal those secrets from this divine counsel up in heaven from God. Why? Not because God doesn't want to speak to the people, but because the people have cast out and stoned and rejected the prophets, and then they get carried away captive. They have no ear for the prophet, and so he's my spirit will not always strive with man, saith the Lord, right? And then he goes on to verse 12, they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. That's a perfect description of a state of apostasy. Oh, and I see this again with this idea of, of water as a symbol of revelation, where it's just like not only literally are the rains going to be taken, but the revelation is cut off and Israel is found wanting. It's interesting to me also, again, we have the word play. You don't see it in English, but it is in Hebrew where you have the d- deliberate consonants being used. Uh, in verse 1, uh, the Lord God showed me into thee a basket of summer fruit, kites. It's a word play, and I think he uses that particular item. He uses flora and fauna. I mean, all things were made to bear witness of Christ. Jesus uses the earth like a chalkboard, but here we have in the next verse, and Amos said, what seest thou? And he said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said unto me, the end is come. Kites, kites. It's, it's the word, the end, but it, it ties in beautifully with the word where I think it's a deliberate poetic device to get their ear to make sure they're getting it, and I think they are getting it, but we just don't see it in the English language. We, we have this in English where you do have something, people might talk about Jesus Christ, and they say, the sun is the sun. And we can do that to say something about Jesus is like the light of the sun. And we have talked many times throughout these videos about how the name is a lesson. And Fred reminded us this was a way of prophesying or teaching the ancient world that doesn't always come through translation, but God was trying to get people's attention. 
Okay, so maybe God doesn't speak that way today. Maybe he doesn't use word plays and puns. We ask ourselves, what does God do today to get our attention? What helps us pay attention to God? And you might ask yourself, when have there been times in your life you have paid attention well to God? And you're like, that really worked well for me. When were there times you struggled to pay attention to God? So you might say, how can I get really good at doing it well? And how can I avoid those times when I struggle to hear the voice of God in a way that he speaks to me? You know, this this reminds me of this. It, it's not as if this digression only goes one way. It's, it's a path. You can go either direction. You can either come closer to God, and the closer you come, the less he has to to use these loud voices of of pestilence and disease and death and destruction, the more he can revert to the still, small whisperings of the Spirit because you've tuned your ear to it as you keep coming closer to him. And it's one of the one of the great examples of this was was the life and ministry of President Thomas S. Monson, where he got to the point where one of my favorite phrases he would use in conference was, "I want the Lord to know that if he needs an errand run, Tom Monson will run that errand for him." And his whole life was one of if he felt even the slightest whispering or the faintest breeze blowing in a certain direction, President Monson had gotten to the point where he would recognize that and he would respond accordingly and act on it. It's a beautiful example for us to follow is to not be the kind of person where the Holy Ghost has to tell us five, six, seven, ten times to do something, but act on those first intimations of the Spirit, as Joseph Smith would refer to them, those first flashes that come and act quickly. So, you know, we've had this uh, really, I mean, there's a few times, seek me, seek me, but most of it's been consequence, consequence, quant- boom, 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 right? The last chapter, we see this so often with the minor prophets, the scattering followed by the gathering, the justice followed by the mercy. So here, the heading of the chapter, Israel shall be sifted. I think, again, you see the earthquake motif or scattered. In the last days, though, they will be gathered So it's interesting, in verse 1, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and you have the post or shaking. Uh, This is fascinating to me, the touching. You can see the earthquake, to me anyway, I I see this being literally shaken. They're, They're moved out because they needed this, and finally they're going to return. In that day, verse 11, the second coming, I will raise up the tabernacle of David again, right? The temple that has fallen and close up the breaches, right? Gathered, healed. And then we see the beautiful uh, imagery here in verse 14, I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel. In other words, I'm going to gather Israel, though it isn't coming across exactly like that in English. I'm going to build up the waste cities. I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of the land which I have given them. So there's hope in Christ. He will forgive us 70 times 7. We just got to make it a little bit easier on ourselves by coming unto him. Yeah, and I love the fact that, once again, he's reverting to to imagery that would be very familiar to not only himself, but most of the people living in in a very agrarian world back then, and it's that idea of Israel is the tender plant of the Lord that is going to be rooted up by Assyria and scattered, but that promise of planting them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God, which for you and me today in this dispensation with our prophets, seers, and revelators telling us the kinds of things they are about the gathering of Israel, it's phenomenal because there's never been a time in the history of the world where prophets have been able to say, when you do this work, it's work that will never be undone. It will never go into that state of apostasy that we talked about back in chapter 7. It will, it will last forever. And, and I love the fact – you brought this up earlier, Fred – that there's this pattern of when you, when you correct, when you rebuke, when you do some discipline or, or, or give some hard sayings, you generally follow that up with, as section, section 121 would say, showing an increase of love. After you've rebuked with sharpness, then you show that, that increase of love, and for me, that's 
what chapter 9 is, is it's the increase of love and it's the promise that, to me, I love the fact that that beautiful hope that Amos is talking about is him prophetically, after seeing the Lord, looking down the corridor of time and seeing the future for these people's descendants, he's looking at our day. We – there was never a better time to be alive than right now. I think if Amos were here, he would smile at you and say, oh, you, you live in that day when all of this is going to come to fruition. These, these people are going to be brought home and planted by you. That's your job. Now can you see why President Nelson says there is nothing more exciting, nothing more worthwhile taking place on the whole planet Earth today than this gathering of Israel effort. And this is an invitation for all of us as teachers because sometimes I know I'm guilty of this. I want to bring on like the outside resources. They're not bad, but we have this clear call. Show how the scriptures all come together instead of always looking for the philosophies of men to reveal what the scriptures mean. <laughs> God has revealed his scriptures to us and he's given prophets to reveal the meaning of scriptures. And if we start there, and Fred, you've really helped us to see how interconnected the Old Testament is with the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants of the New Testament, we can find greater concentrated meaning of finding God through these texts. They're all meant to testify of one. You know, to, to tag on to, to what you two are saying here, what Fred has demonstrated is that if you read the Book of Mormon with an understanding that, wow, Amos is one of those books that predates Isaiah, it would have probably been on the brass plates, and some of those ideas, those motifs would carry through and inspire Lehi, Nephi, Jacob, and all future writers in the, in the Book of Mormon, it, it makes it easier for us to see how interconnected these are. What a powerful thing to be able to see the Lord on every page of every scripture and see how he's not the, – the Book of Mormon is not in competition with the Bible never has been, never will be. These two are complementary and both of them testify that Jesus is the Christ. They may do it through different means, different symbols, different language techniques, but that's what they're doing. So now let's shift our focus to the one chapter of the book of Obadiah. And as Taylor will often say, the, the name is the lesson. Obed is a servant and Ayah I-A-H is the root for Yahweh, so it's a servant of the Lord. Uh, at the end of the day, I hope that I'm an Obadiah. I hope that you're an Obadiah. And as you look at what he, he talks about here, we're going to focus on the, the land of Edom, but towards the end you'll notice he talks beautifully to you and me if we'll let him have a voice through the quarter of time. And the invitation is that if you look at the very last verse, he invites all of us to be Obadiahs. As we get into this, in the heading of the chapter, Obadiah prophesies the downfall of Edom. Savior shall stand upon Mount Zion. So we ask ourselves, uh, where do we get the Edomites from? And, and Tyler gave us that map right southeast of the Dead Sea. So we have Jacob who had a brother named Esau, right, who sold his birthright, and we know from the book of Genesis that his descendants, if we go back to about Genesis chapter 36, we find that we have the generations of Esau who is Edom. And so this is an interesting book. The Edomites are on the king's highway. We get also this, you'll find the word uh, Idumea that's used in DNC section 136 being symbolic of the world, and it's an interesting thing because the King's Highway, you'd have all these worldly things, right? Anybody that's ever been to Petra where you have these incredible cliffs, it's very strategic, but these people are set up with this false security. And so this looks to be something written just shortly after the um, Babylonian captivity, maybe right after 586. So we think, you know, contemporary of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Obadiah, servant of the Lord. And so when the Jews are trying to flee, I mean, the Edomites are just thrilled with this, 
And so they're trying to cut them off. They're rejoicing over the capture of their brethren, the slaying of their brethren, right? So even though that Jacob and Esau worked things out, it looks like their descendants did not, which unfortunately is the case even in modern times. But I would just like to, as I see this, when I look at this book, and uh, you see like in chapter uh, verse 10, for thy violence against thy brother J Jacob, shame shall cover thee. And uh, in the day that thou should, that thou stoodest on the other side and day that the strangers, in other words, the foreigners carried away captive the Babylonians, you just sat there, right? And, and it was mocking. It was rejoicing in verse 12. You rejoiced over the suffering of your brother as opposed to, if we, can, we look at the Book of Mormon and we see Alma in chapter 29, verse 14, who says, I do not joy in my own success alone, but my joy is more full because of the success of my brethren. This is where we want to be. I think it's a stark contrast. Yeah, the Edomites, essentially as cousins of the Israelites, are glorying in the punishments and suffering that the Israelites are experiencing at the hand of the Babylonians. And in some cases plundering the Israelites and taking their resources and saying, wow, we now get their homes and their gardens and their all the resources. And Obadiah, speaking for the Lord, is saying, that is never how you should treat people in their time of distress. Never take advantage of other people. Never take the time to glory in other people's suffering. But what do we learn at the baptism covenant? That we are asked to suffer with those that suffer, to lift up those who struggle, that is the essence of God's covenant to us that we make to him and everybody. Love God, love your neighbor. And what we have in Obadiah, if we could just kind of summarize it, is that the Edomites, some of the Edomites at this time, were not practicing love your neighbor. And Obadiah is speaking on behalf of the Lord saying, you guys will now have to suffer the consequences of breaking that covenant of failing to love your neighbor. Which, if you think about that from an eternal perspective, what if we could... What if we could have a conversation with some of those Edomites who were, who were doing this, entering into the gate of my people in verse 13, in the day of their calamity, and looking on their affliction and laid hands on their substance? What if we could talk to any of them today? Do you think any of those individuals would say, oh, let me tell you all the amazing possessions I gained? during that experience. I was so glad to see the Israelites be carried off captive by Babylon. I was cheering cheering those uh, non-Israelites on to, to carry them away, and let me tell you about all of the riches and all of the wonders and glories that I gained. Do you think any of them would say that? I could be wrong, but I think they would say, oh, I was so focused on completely the wrong thing. I missed it. I missed it. And because of that, all of these promises from, from Obadiah were brought to pass on my head, and it's a regret. Now, again, instead of us sitting here pointing fingers of scorn or mockery back through the corridor of time at these Edomites, back to the Mormon chapter 9 verse to say, wait, learn from us. Don't do this with each other. Don't have your heart so set upon the things of the world that that's what you spend all of your time and energy focusing on pursuing because it, it doesn't end well. Uh, verse 15, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Reminds me of the Savior's teaching of, for with whatsoever judgment ye judge, therewith shall ye be judged. So it's, we, we could all be very careful today in how we treat each other, especially when somebody's struggling, that, that uh, they need our compassion. Oh, so true. I, I wanted to go back to your point too, um, Tyler, that there's nothing old about the Old Testament about the application. You know, Paul was, what a scholar of the Old Testament, you know, taking the Septuagint, traveling the Mediterranean. Um, but I, I love this. In his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 10, verse 11, he's relating several events in the Old Testament. And he says, all these things happen to them for examples. The JST says, they are written for our admonition, right? 
and they are, are they're, they're written up upon whom the ends of the world are come. So it's, you know, this whole idea, these things we can, if we can get it, we do not have to repeat this. If we can simply get, if we can liken the scriptures unto ourselves, and uh, I, I just, I, I think uh, sometimes it's more important to be reminded than it is to be instructed. I learned from Elder Maxwell one day, and I, I think it's so important we capture that or reminded of it. It's true. Uh, the gospel is pretty simple. It's love God, love your neighbor. It's important we are reminded of these things and not to get lost in the weeds of ancient culture and context, which are helpful to see what's going on, but ultimately, the scriptures are not simply for people who are long in the past. They were preserved over the years for us, that we can choose to avoid the pain of past bad choices that other people have made, but instead, we can learn how to find the joy that God has designed for everybody who chooses to be with them. So, you see this pattern and we've seen it multiple times already in the Old Testament, and we've, we saw it with Amos, you get these dire prophecies, these, these major consequences, well, we got it again in Obadiah, in verse 1 through 16. So, just take a guess, how is Obadiah going to end his book? Is he going to end it with, therefore, there's nothing to look forward to, all is lost, and it's all a failure? God's plan has been overthrown? No. He ends with, God will prevail. And, and I love this idea that uh, in trying to not repeat history, the bad parts of history, we know how this ends in our day. We know that it's the kingdom of God is going to fill the whole earth. God will triumph. The question is, will I be a part of that kingdom and its triumph? That's the only question that's in, in play here. It's not the angels aren't up in heaven saying, ooh, look how bad things are going down there on the earth. I wonder, I wonder if things are going to turn out okay. They're going to turn out beautifully in the end, collectively. The question is, how do they turn out individually? And so, watch what happens as Obadiah helps us become a little bit less focused on self and on gratifying what I want for me and for my pride and my possessions, and helping us to become a little bit more like the Savior and turn outward in this gathering effort, beginning in verse 17, but upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. You'll notice the, the finality of that, shall be. It's not, hmm, probability's pretty good here, I, I'm, I'm hedging my bets on this one, it's, no, there will be deliverance on Mount Zion, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. I love it when prophets speak in absolutes. And the house of Jacob shall be a, fi a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. You'll notice how he ends his book. And saviors, notice the plural there, shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. What does that communicate, Fred? Well, I, I immediately thought of the man who has the keys of this dispensation that presides over it. The prophet Joseph Smith asked this rhetorical question, but how are they to become saviors on Mount Zion? Answer, by building their temples, receiving all the ordinances upon their heads in behalf of their progenitors. And every time the prophet Joseph dedicated land and broke land to build a temple and built those temples, it's as if all hell gathered against him and the saints, because that is the means whereby this, this gathering was going to be able to come to fruition. And what a great message. This is only 21 verses. This is the shortest book in the Old Testament. Uh, small, but mighty in spirit. And if we tie it back into the meaning of the name, what do we do in temples? We serve the Lord. And Obadiah means servant of Jehovah or servant of the Lord. So in our own lives, we can ask ourselves, how am I an Obadiah? How am I serving the Lord? How am I letting him help me 
become a savior on Mount Zion or in a temple because I'm participating in serving him and his children on both sides of the veil. Isn't this fun? When you dive into scriptures, you, you don't have to know as much as Fred about the Hebrew and being able to connect them to all these uh, restoration scriptures to find great meaning at whatever level you may be if you're, as Fred said earlier, if we turn to the Lord and take steps in that direction and we, we just do our best to come closer to him, the Lord will give us amazing, amazing lessons off these pages. I want to just thank uh, you, Tyler and Taylor. I, I love teaching with you. I'm thinking in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established, but uh, i am of course, never been on Book of Mormon Central. I just want to bear my witness that Jesus Christ is the God of the Old Testament. He's the Redeemer of Israel and that he loves us and that redemption is possible if we will seek him, if we'll come unto him. I testify there's nothing old about the Old Testament as far as the application, and I do that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.